a particular piece I want to talk about today on why, um, why it's important and for you and why it makes sense for you to adopt the new APIs you're proposing early on is that, as I, as I explained, the way standards work on the web, it's really not that you have to wait for a standard to be passed before a standard is usable. If that was the case, then the web would be much, much slower than it is today. For example, the, the, the CSS standard has been in the making for many, many years and is still not ready. And there's still significant parts of the CSS specification that are not fully standardized. And what we do in the web when that happens, we use prefixes. So the transform uh, CSS style property, for example, which is very popular on the web to do like 3D animations uh, of HTML5 content. I am, the different browser vendors agreed on the specific format of that transform style. I think it has a little been weeks since there's agreement now and we removed prefixes. So the way this prefixes works basically as long Mozilla is implementing a piece of web technology where we are not 100% certain that all the browser vendors agree what it's going to work like and that there's no final standard by the W3C, we tend to use a little prefix. And Mozilla uses a prefix MOZ, MOZ. So it was not transform in our uh, implementation, it was MOZ transform. The reason we do that is so that if there's some change coming down the road, because all the browser vendors agree in a standards body that we should maybe tweak something, we don't want to collide with that. We don't want to create incompatible APIs. So when we are proposing prototype implementations and we are implementing them early, we always use a little prefix to indicate that. Um, so a, a tricky piece here is for a web developer to know is like, is it safe for me to use this specific piece of technology? Like, is it, am I going to start using this technology? Maybe it doesn't get standardized. Maybe it goes away. And in our experience, often the difference between these different implementations is really very small. So if you, look, if you take the transform property, for example, there were some tiny differences between WebKit and Mozilla's implementation in Gecko for that uh, style property for a little while. But really, for most use cases, it was pretty much exactly the same. So we expect the same thing to happen with the new APIs we're proposing here. It's very likely that the telephony API, which is a big piece of complex API, it's very likely that some small pieces of it are going to change. So in a year from now, maybe, when we have a final standard on it, and you, have, you will see it in other browser engines as well, and on other devices made by other people, you will likely see small differences in the telephony API. But overall, the main structure of the API should be um, pretty much the same. So it's often, it makes a lot of sense to start using these APIs early and relying on these prefixed APIs. And then the moment there's any kind of changes and the, once there's a final standard, you can then see these prefixes disappear once there's agreement between all the different browser vendors. Now, so far we have talked mostly from a developer perspective uh, about this, and you're an application developer. But since um, many of you are uh, affiliated with Vivo, you have also a per particular operator perspective on this. This is where things get really interesting, because if you look at existing, these existing proprietary systems, if you want to take the device and extend the device, you're again locked into this ecosystem, right? If you want to extend an, an Android device, you have to write some Android-specific code. If you would like to change the way the devices uh, are used by the user when they unpack the device for the first time on an Apple device, you have to go and write some Apple-specific code. Here, HTML5 becomes really handy. Once the entire user interface is written with HTML5, it means that you can use the same technologies that you're building to, use build, to build web applications with. You can actually apply to the phone itself. So as we are going through some of the demos here and uh, the hacking part of the session, you will see that every, every piece of this phone, everything that you can see and interact with is completely written in HTML5. So it's basically as easy to write an application for this device as it is to actually change the device itself. So if you don't like the way your home screen works, for example, all the code for it is completely open source. You can just download the open source version of it. You can start modifying it. You can have an entirely different home screen. You have a pretty straightforward grid of applications home screen. If you don't like that, you can very easily turn into a 3D home screen if you like. All right, um, before Philip is going to start talking about some of the more technical parts of the system, I want to explain a little bit the general structure of the project. So that the Firefox OS, or, or Open Web Devices project, has really uh, three main parts to the system. 
And f of that, the, the one that's the most interesting to most of you, I think, is the Gaia part. So Gaia is the code name for our user interface implementation. And what, what stands out about Gaia is everything in Gaia is completely HTML5. So our goal is to make sure that you can use HTML5 to implement a complete phone user experience, and the code name for that in our system is Gaia. So everything on this front you see, the home screen, the status bar, if a call is coming in, the call screen, the dialer, the settings application, every piece of the phone experience is in this Gaia system. It's open source, it's available um, from our website, and it's completely implemented with HTML5. And this HTML5 system sits on top of Gecko. Gecko is Mozilla's browser engine, or rendering engine, as we call it. This is basically the implementation of the web stack. So Gecko implements HTML5, and it implements CSS, and JavaScript, and a couple other web technologies like WebGL. This is actually the same rendering engine we're using in Firefox as well. So this rendering engine is used by half a billion people or so across the different devices that we support as part of Firefox. This is the reason that we could build this system so quickly. As I already told you earlier, this entire system basically was built in a year or so, give or take. We were able to do that because most parts of the system actually already existed. So we're using exactly the same rendering engine as we're using on desktop and on our Android versions of Firefox. And as a result of that, most of the technology that go, it goes into this phone, like the ability to render content and the ability to like playback music or videos, already existed. So really what we had to add were pretty small pieces. We had to add things like telephony or Bluetooth. We didn't have to actually create a rendering stack for the web. So the Gecko piece will interact with because your Gaia pieces that we are talking about here today sit on top of Gecko, but it's very rarely that you actually have to go anywhere inside the platform. Our goal really is to create a system where everything that you need to do and anything you need to change to affect the user experience, you can do here in Gaia on the HTML5 side. And then Gecko itself sits on top of Gonk. And Gonk is a code name for, um, this is basically an operating system abstraction or a hardware abstraction. When we created this project, we decided that there's no point really for Mozilla to create a new operating system kernel. Uh, Android devices use the Linux kernel. We decided we are simply going to use the same Linux kernel, the same open source Linux kernel that Android uses as well. Mostly because we, we didn't think that there's much for Mozilla to improve in there. Mozilla is not an operating system kernel vendor. We have a lot of experience with the web stack, so we are really great at making the web rendering engine, but we have little experience with kernels, especially for, for mobile phones. So we simply went ahead, and in Gong, we are reusing some of the same open source components that you can find in Android as well. Most importantly, we're using the same Linux kernel, and we are using some of the same device drivers and abstractions that Android uses as well. So Android uses some open source pieces. We basically use the same kind of open source pieces. And these open source pieces, including the kernel, is what Gecko sits on and starts on these devices. This piece, you have to interact with even less so. It is very unlikely that any of you will ever have to touch any code in this system here. And actually today, even we very, very rarely have to touch anything in here. So really, the most of the work we are doing is adding new capabilities and standards to the web engine, and then adding new capabilities and features to the HTML5 user experience. The Gong system is basically just kind of like the, the foundation of the system, so the system can boot. All right, um, I'm about to hand off to Philip. Um, yeah? Yes, please. Yeah, on the Gong part, how much uh, it's. Uh, I know the focus is for the Gaia part, yeah. web apps, but how much would you like investing uh, in terms of, I don't know, research or the time that you guys spend in Gong for integration with Gecko more? Like, I'm curious about that. Okay. Yeah, so, so first of all, um, Please feel free to ask parts, uh, questions about any parts of these. So Philip and I are actually both engineers. We understand a good part of the stack. Like, I thought you are most interested in HTML5. That's why I'm talking most of HTML5. If you're interested in Gong, we can, we can do an entire hour-long session on the details of the Gong system. So please make sure to ask any questions you want to know. Um, you may want to repeat the question. OK, so the question was, um, how much time we spend to build the Gong system and uh, how much effort goes in there to porting Gecko onto the Gong system. So actually, that, that's, that's really a very good question. I can go in a little bit more detail why we choose the Android Linux kernel or the, the same Linux kernel Android uses and the same device drivers. And uh, we actually have ports of Gecko 
to other similar systems that are not using the, the same Linux kernel Android users as well. So the main reason we really did this, uh, we used the, the, the Linux kernel that Android uses as well, is that we actually already had a version of Gecko that runs on that. Because uh, Mozilla has been shipping fi Firefox for Android for quite a while. And that system actually is compiled for the same Linux kernel. The integration we have between Gong and Gecko is a little bit tighter than it is on the actual Android versions. So in case of Android, for example, when you're, re you're trying to render content, you don't really get access directly to the hardware. You have to talk to some Java code, and that Java code talks to some C++ code, and that C++ code has to talk to another process. So there's a bunch of copies and, and overhead in between before you can render a, a pixel to the screen. In, in Gong, we have eliminated much of this. So Android needs this because there's Java that can write to the screen, and in our case, uh, there's the browser can write to the screen. In the Gong system itself, the only thing that ever renders to the screen is actually the, the web engine, Gecko. So we have eliminated a lot of the overhead in between. We are sitting directly on the frame buffer. So the basic code was already there. Within a day or two, we just took the Android version of Firefox and we could run it on top of Gong. And then over time, we have t more tightly integrated the system to optimize it. And we have also gotten a lot of help from our chipset vendors, um, uh, especially Qualcomm, who is our launch partner. And we have very closely integrated and optimized at this point the gunk layer for Gecko. But in the beginning, basically, it was possible for us to quick start very, very fast because we already had an implementation for that. Now, that having said, there's no particular advantage, really, on the technology side of using the Android Linux kernel, or what we call the gunk abstraction. It simply was just a shortcut. We felt that OEMs already know how to make devices using this kernel and using those device drivers. And if you're an OEM, you already have basically all the capabilities to run our system. And this is also a practical experience. So we, about a year ago or so, when we first met with Qualcomm, they had a reference device we had never seen before. And they were curious, can you run boot to get on this system? So in that meeting, while we were discussing like, strategic steps how to do that, two engineers who were in the meeting actually, during the meeting, sat down. And one was a Qualcomm engineer with the device, and the other one was an engineer from Mozilla who knew the stack. They basically took the Android system on there and took all the top parts of it off, the Dalvik parts and all these things, and put our Gecko engine on top of it. And this in that meeting, basically, the first version of boot to Gecko ran on this phone device we have never seen before. This is the case with many OEMs. That if you know how to make Android devices, you also know how to bring up our stack. That's the main reason we are using Gong. Technically speaking, there's not a lot of advantages in it. So uh, we know that someone has ported uh, Gecko and th this entire stack onto a pure Linux-based system that does not use the specific Android optimized Linux kernel. They are using a straight-up Linux kernel. Um, so we, we can very easily port to other hardware abstraction systems. The reason we used Android simply was a shortcut. It was, there was many good choices, and this was one of them. Does that answer your question? Okay, so the question is whether in the system that we have de describing here, how updates work. And um, in, in Android, there are certain problems with the update system. There's all these different OEMs that ship updates separately on separate schedules, and often devices don't get updated. And the question was whether Gecko solves some part of this uh, and whether the Gecko updates are coming from Mozilla. So the answer is roughly yes, with a couple like asterisks and disclaimers on it. So we have actually, the, our update story has really three parts. So if you look at the system, the, the gunk part of the system is the, the lowest part of the system. That's where the kernel sits, the device drivers, and all these pieces. This piece can be updated using the same traditional OEM-based over-the-air update that you know today on smartphones. So if your Android smartphone today has to be updated, but basically what happens, they send you an update that replaces the entire system on the device. That's pretty risky, and it has to be done by the OEM because only the OEM has the actual device drivers and all the pieces for it. 
So that is how you can update or the gunk part of a system. If in our system the kernel is somehow broken, you have to use the traditional, slow, complicated, over-the-air update system. The goal actually is to almost never have to update gonk. So the only time you would have to update gonk if there's literally there's a bug in a kernel. Like you, the OEM shipped the device, and the kernel is defective and must be, must be fixed so people can use their device. That would be the only time we ever have to ship a traditional over-the-air update where you have to go to the OEM for your update piece. On top of that, we have actually a much more fine-grained update structure. So Gecko itself is separate from the Gong system. And as you know from the desktop, we have a certain expectation of the desktop. So for example, if there's a security vulnerability in Firefox, you can expect that Mozilla is going to fix that within days. So often, within 48 hours or, seven, or 72 hours, Mozilla will prepare an update, will fix the security vulnerability, and make an available an update to everyone and it can be downloaded automatically and applied. So on a desktop, we expect this. You would, many people would not use a desktop browser if the vendor does not guarantee this level of security. On, these, on smartphone systems, it's entirely different. If you pull out an Android smartphone, the browser on there is often many months out of date. I would bet you most of the phones in this room here, the browser is at least 9 to 12 months out of date. And it's full of security holes. The reason that they cannot easily update that is that they have to update the entire system. You have to go to the OEM. It's really complicated. So this is where the system actually works very differently. So the gunk layer, which we think never has to be updated except if the device is defective, this only the OEM can update. For Gecko, actually, Mozilla will prepare the same binary Gecko for all versions of this phone. So there's a clean interface in between. It doesn't matter what OEM sold you the gunk part. The same, five, the, the, the same Gecko binary runs on top of all these devices. And Mozilla actually creates the updates for that. So as long as the OEM and the operator agree, they can use our version of Gecko that we make available very quickly after a, secure, uh, after a security fix, for example. The third piece of this is the Gaia system. This actually is HTML5. So this can sit on a server. So if you have an application, for example, if your home screen uh, is hosted by Vivo, then you can update the home screen, and you can immediately roll out the updates to it. So the Gaia system is really more cloud-based. It, it feels almost like a website, depending on what kind of application you are using. So in, in some of the uh, applications where you don't have special privileges, you don't need uh, to access the radio, for example, you can this can literally be based in the cloud. You have, Vivo has a website. It can update. And the web applications get offline cached onto the device and updated. Now, there's, I mentioned that there's a disclaimer after add here. So uh, due to certain regulatory constraints and lab testing and uh, operator rules, in many cases, Mozilla will not be able to apply a Gecko update directly. So on a desktop, we push out updates. On these devices, we will make updates available, but actually then the operators and the OEMs will do some testing before they allow their devices to download the update. So I, I would expect that the cycle is not going to be as fast as on desktop. You will not be, get within a couple days your security update. We will make it available within a few days. And then the carriers and the OEMs will do some testing and make sure it works on their networks and with their devices. And then we'll enable this part to be downloaded. But still, due to the fact that we can very easily exchange this part here, and because it's very small, and does not need a whole update, we should be able to update this device as much, much quicker. Does this make sense? Yes. Please. Uh, it's about the user experience. Mm -hmm. So considering the smartphone has much smaller uh, screen, the user experience, the user interface is much more important. And uh, in the mobile, you would say that the user expected much more than a web browser. So, uh, from the point of view of the developer, it's hard to work with Android sometimes because there is this huge amount of screen size and different manufacturers and all that. And from this point of view, it's easier to work with, with iOS, for example. H how do you feel about that? I mean, if the, if the, if the platform is so, so open as it is, don't you think that developers will be afraid to work in, a, in an environment that's so so the question is about um, screen sizes, as an example, on Android, where you have many different devices with different screen sizes. It causes a certain amount of fragmentation. And it's very difficult to develop for that, because you have to develop for all these different screen sizes. And um, is that maybe a problem? And, and maybe it's easier to develop for iOS, where you have only two screen sizes. And this is a problem if you have a very open system, where there's not a lot of control on it, because there's this kind of fragmentation. So, uh, and, and also, uh, I think the question also highlights how important it is 
to have good user interface and, and responsive applications on these mobile applica on these mobile devices because users expect more from their phones than they do from the desktop. So first of all, to the, 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 la the last part of the question, I totally agree. Like, people have much higher expectations on the quality of the user interface on their smartphone devices than they have on a desktop. So there's a recognition on that, for example, the, the, dev the first device, the first Firefox OS or open web device we are making is very much targeting uh, a very affordable price point. We call it the, the, the smart light um, device. So we are making a smartphone that is almost as affordable as a feature phone. The goal is basically to bring, feature, uh, to, to bring smartphone experiences to a lot of people who in the past have been price-wise locked into the feature phone segment. The goal basically is to make a device that, that's as, as a solid, essential smartphone experience. All the things that you expect from a smartphone are in the device. But at the same time, it's, uh, the price point is very affordable. And we are also feature set wise. We're not, we're not trying to compete with every single feature that you can find in Android 4.1 or iOS 5. We're basically going after a very essential and important uh, subset of the smartphone experience. But at the same time, even though we are ma making these very affordable devices, we, every, main, every, every animation on this device, we expect to be 60 frames per second. People simply expect that. If you pick up a device and you like, move the home screen around, you want everything to be smooth and performant. So we actually spend a lot of time optimizing the web stack to make it sure that you can use HTML5 to implement this very responsive uh, and, and very high quality user interactions. Now on the screen size uh, issue, that's actually an, uh, a problem of the web in general. So if you look at the web across all these different devices where you have the web already today, you have already a number of different resolutions, right? It, let's say you are the person responsible for the Amazon.com website. People can go to your website with desktop browsers, with resolutions from like 640 times 800 or uh, uh, times 400 or 480, all the way to like retina displays with 3,000 times 2,000 pixels. So there's already a huge variance just on desktop monitors. Then there's tablets. There's tablets with like low resolution, high resolution. There's retina display tablets. Then you have, you have phones where you can go to the Amazon site with all these different resolutions. So the web already today is much, much more fragmented on the display resolution side in Android, for example. The reason that it works, actually, is that the web has much better mechanisms to deal with fragmentation, because it has this, this idea of interoperability and, and choice built into it. So often, when you write web applications, you, you use a concept called uh, feature detection. So since you have a site you're writing that you can go to with different browsers that might have different capabilities, what you end up doing, you have to test and your page is displaying, do I have this capability? Do I have this capability? Amongst other CSS offers you the ability to tune your display properties depending on the size of display and the display resolution. So this technology already all exists in HTML5, and we're just inheriting that. So on the devices we are, we are, you see here today, you can go with the device to many web pages out there that already exist. They were not tuned specifically for the open web device. Yet, it works just fine, because the page detects, uh-huh, this is your screen resolution. It's like an old iPhone 1, basically. Uh, on the device we're making, we are using HPGA as well. So they have to display the right resolution for it. So I agree with you in general. It's very important to um, make sure that you have responsive designs and you, ha your, uh, you utilize the screen real estate well and optimize for display resolution. But I think the web is already ready for that. Like th this problem has existed for a long time, and I think we have some pretty good solutions for that.